Welcome to one of the summary videos for the search for better health context point number two. So the actual videos that are covered in this summary video will be these five. This is your actual syllabus. So all of these belong to the second context point. And these are the ones we cover, which are the same as these ones here. What I'll do in a second is I'll go for the actual videos. I'll cover the verbs, the important verbs, and the content, the content you need to know for each video. And you can see here on the sides, you've got the links to each individual video. You can just skip, press it, and you can actually fly that part. You won't change videos, it's all in the same video, but you can always press and change change parts of the actual summary. All right, so what I'll do in a second, I'll go for the first one, which is distinguish between non-infectious and infectious disease. In this case, we need to know what distinguish means. Distinguish means we need to tell the difference between, right? So we need to tell the difference between infectious and non-infectious. So infectious disease is caused by a pathogen, that's really important. It also must be contagious, which means it must be able to, you must be able to infect someone else. And you must, it must be transmittable, which means it must get from one person to another person. And it can either be direct, so for example, by going in your saliva or the air, or it can be carried in a vector, which is a mosquito. So these are all what we know about infectious disease. Non-infectious, these are caused by genetic, environmental, or lifestyle, or nutritional factors. Uh, this is different to infectious, but that is caused by a pathogen. Remember, you need to distinguish, tell the difference. So infectious is caused by a pathogen, whereas non-infectious is caused by gen genetic, environmental, lifestyle, or nutritional factors. It's also non-contagious, whereas infectious is contagious. And only the genetic disease can be transmittable, whereas with the other one, all are transmittable. Right? All must be transmittable for it to be an infectious disease, whereas non-infectious is just gen genetic ones. And some examples would be the cold, flu, AIDS for infectious, and heart disease, skin cancer, Down syndrome, and scurvy for non-infectious. Right? So in this case, just tell the difference between these two, and remember kind of these main features. Next one is what is a pathogen? It says identify the, path the conditions under which an organism is described as a pathogen. Identify the conditions basically just means name, recognize the conditions. You just need to be able to name them. So what is a pathogen? It's any organism or infective agent that can cause disease. If you just remember any organism that can cause disease, that's fine enough as well. But I prefer any organism or infective agent because I consider prions, for example, to be infective agents. But these are some of the examples of pathogens, prions, virus, bacteria, protozoa, fungi, or macroparasites, these are the ones you need to know. But you should also know that not all of them are actually um, pathogens, right? We have some good bacteria that won't be pathogenic, whereas so we have some bad bacteria that will be pathogenic. So it's actually if it causes disease, then it's, that is pathogenic. So not all bacteria are, but some are. These are the, some of the actual conditions. They must be able to cause disease, that's really important. If they don't cause disease, then they're not a pathogen must live in or on in another organism. That organism we often call host. Host just means another organism that something lives in. Again, if they don't do this, they're not a pathogen. Because if they can't live in, in or on us, they can't cause disease. And they must be infectious and contagious. Or contagious, right? Basically, they need to be able to go from one person to another person through either air, saliva, or a vector. These are some of the conditions. And then one example I want to give you about the skin microflora. Skin microflora is all, all of our actual bacteria or different types of uh, microbes living on our skin. Now, uh, the skin microbes, the actual organisms living on our skin, are not pathogenic when they're on our skin, right? So when it's on their, our skin, they don't cause disease. Most of them don't cause disease. But when these actual same bacteria enter our body, so they actually become pathogenic. So that's how one organism could be a non-pathogenic uh, bacteria on our skin, but then become a pathogen and actually enters our body. Right? But the main Probably need to know about this actual one is just these ones that they must be able to cause disease, live in or on another organism, and they must be infectious or contagious. And remember this definition of the pathogen as well. The next one is explain why cleanliness in food, water, and personal hygiene practices assist in the control of disease. In this case, explain just means show why and or how. So show why, uh, why and or how cleanliness in food, water, and personal hygiene practices assist in control of disease. First, you should know that pathogens actually be found in water, in food, or on our body, right? That's important. Pathogens can be found. Remember, pathogens are the things that can cause disease. So that means that if we have cleanliness in food, water, and personal hygiene, that means we can remove the pathogens, right? So first you need to know, okay, look, you've got some pathogens that can be in food, water, or our skin or our body. If we have good practices when it comes to food, water, and personal hygiene, we can remove those pathogens. And if we remove those pathogens, what that means is we reduce the risk of the transmission of pathogens. As if we remove pathogens, they can't cause disease. 
right? So by having clean practices, we basically assist the control of disease by removing pathogens that will otherwise get into our body or someone else's body, right? That's basically what that means. So in this case, when it comes to food, we should know, we need to talk about each of them. You need to have an example for food, water, and personal hygiene. There's some examples, you might want to remember one or two in general, but you need to remember them and also say how they would help. So for example, if we're wearing gloves or hats, we can make sure that we have the actual bacteria that are on our skin, not getting it onto food, and that food would be eaten by someone else. If we refrigerate food, that means we can't, have, we don't want to have this happening, where we have actual um, bacterial growth on food, and if someone eats that, they might get infected. And if we cook or heat food, then that, that actual food will have no or less pathogens because they would have been killed by the actual heating process. Same with boiling water, it kills pathogens, thereby less pathogens will enter our, our body. Chlorinated water, again, same, same process, kills pathogens, which means less actually enter our body. Brushing our teeth, that's an example of personal hygiene. This means what we do to our body, personal hygiene. So if we brush our teeth, that means that we have less pathogens in our mouth. If we use tissue when sneezing, that means we don't transmit bacteria by having it in our, our snot. We wash our hands off the toilet, that's obviously fair enough. There might be a, a bacteria in our, in our actual feces or on our hands. And we, if we take regular showers, that means we also kill anything that might be on it. Uh, the next one is a experiment. It says, students will identify data, plan and choose equipment or resources to perform a first investigation to identify microbes in food or water. So there's a couple of parts here. The actual purpose of the experiment was identify microbes in food or water. That means you needed to do an experiment that you could actually find out how much microbes might be in a certain sample of water or food. And remember, you did the agar plate experiments. This was this experiment, the agar plate experiment. First thing it said, you need to identify data sources. So what that means, identify data sources means determine the type of data and explain explain how it can be used or how it should be analyzed to get good information. Right. So the first part, determine what kind of data we're looking at. In this case, just the amount of colonies that have grown after a period of time. Right? So by looking at how much has grown, we can see if um, there's much contamination or little contamination. So we, our type of data we collect is the amount of growth. And how we analyze it is the more colonies have grown, the more it must have been to begin with, the more microbes must begin to, win, to, be, to begin with. That means the more contaminated the actual water or food was. And that's the first part. And it says, plan and choose a equipment. In this case, what you should have done is you should have designed your own experiment to identify microbes in food or water. So you needed to talk about reliability. That's what plan says. Plan means reliability. So repeat numerous times. You should have done your experiment quite a few times. Validity means you make sure your actual procedure is correct. Right? So dependent variables, this is where dependent variables comes in play. That's how many, for example, what you measure, right? So dependent variables, what you measure is the number of colonies. Independent variable is what you change. So for example, you might have different types of food samples or water samples. That's what you would have changed. And your control variables are, for example, things you keep the same at all times. So you, how, how long they are, get, are left to grow, the amount of sample you have in each agar plate, and the incubation temperature. So 37 degrees Celsius for all different agar plates. So the things you kept the same. So each of these you should have kept in um, under control when you actually designed your experiments. And then a, a experiment you might have designed would have been maybe, for example, you had your samples, you got two samples, one from a creek, one from sterilized water. Then you had to sterilize your equipment that you're gonna use to make sure that no pathogens are in the actual, on the actual hook. Then you would have uh, inoculated, which means you would have put bacteria on your actual plates with that S shape from both samples. You had your samples, which are obviously locked up to make sure no pathogens can come in. Um, then you put those agar plates into an incubator at a temperature, certain temperature, for a couple of days, and then you would have compared the results. So you'd have seen how much how much goes on A and how much goes on B. And the one that had more growth would be more contaminated to begin with. Right, so this, this kind of procedure is a straightforward procedure that you might have done, something similar to what you might have done. And the next part says, choose equipment or resources, select most appropriate equipment and do risk assessment. So you need to select the most appropriate equipment and also do a risk assessment for when it says choose equipment or resources. So in this case, I would have said, okay, two, we had two beakers, we had 200 mils of water, creek water, and, and 200 mils of sterilized water. We had some four agar plates. We could do the experiment a couple of times. We had the inoculating loop. We had the Bunsen burner, and we had the incubator. And then I would have said, at here, this is a risk because we might burn ourselves, so there might be a risk here. And there might be a risk after we have grown the actual microbes uh, because these microbes might be dangerous. So if they leave, 
the actual plate, then they might cause problems. So these are some of the examples of um, the risk assessment you've done as well. And then last part was perform a first investigation, which means you just need to be able to recall the procedure you did in class, so what you actually did, and also the safe practices that you had that you made, made sure that no one got hurt. Right? So for example, first, if we use that same experiment here, first you would collect your samples, then you would have sterilized your equipment, and this was just one of the safety concerns. Right? The safety concerns was that you might burn yourself, and the safety precaution would be just be to be careful when you actually sterilize the equipment. Then you might, then you had your inoculating um, agar plates, you put the actual bacteria on there, and you would have talked about how you did it, do it properly, 45 degree angle, don't um, breathe into it and all that kind of stuff. Right? And then you would have put it into the incubator at the set temperature, and then at the end you compared it, right? and you would have said, you know, don't open the reopen the place because otherwise there's again there is a risk here. You might um, get those pathogens to escape from the plate if you reopen it. So don't reopen it to make sure there's no risk. So these would be things you need to know. You need to be able to um, identify what kind of data you would be collecting. Uh, you need to know the purpose of the experiment. You need to know in this case because it's planned. You need to be able to design your own experiment. You need to be able to choose the appropriate equipment and know what the risks are. And also you need to be able to recall the procedures you did in class and also the safe working practices. Next one is students will gather, process and analyze information from secondary sources to describe ways in which drinking water can be treated and use available evidence to explain how these methods reduce the risk of infection from pathogens. In this case we've got, for example, gather, process and then analyze. So this means we need to be able to collect information from tables or from other sources. We need to find out, process means we need to find out if it's valid information, if it's uh, information we can trust. And analyze means we need to be able to make connections between the actual information we collect and the question we have to answer. So the question we have to answer is describe ways in which drinking water can be treated and use available evidence to explain how these methods can, re can reduce the risk of infection from pathogens. So there's two things we have to do. First, it says describe ways in which um, drinking water can be treated. So describe ways means provide features and characteristics in which drinking water can be treated. In this case, we have to talk about the water treatment plant and also boiling water. So these are the two ways, boiling water and water treatment. These are two ways you need to remember. Boiling water is a simple process in terms of how it works. All you do is you increase the temperature to boiling, so about 100 degrees Celsius. You leave the pathogens for about five to 10 minutes in that water, and anything that comes out of it will be clean. The water will be boiled and the pathogens will be killed. Right? That's how that works. The other one is a water treatment plant. And this was straight from one of the HC questions, but it's a bit more not complicated, but a bit more to it. There's four different stages. There's coagulation, which is the first stage. In the coagulation stage, what happens is you, is you add a coagulant, which is something that clumps things up. You add that to water, and that makes the solids clump up together. Right. So first, you've got your coagulation stage, then your sedimentation stage. This is where these clumped up solids, which happen in the first stage, these clumped up solid, solids um, form sediment at the bottom of the layer or the bottom of the tank. Right. So you can see a sink to the bottom of the tank these layers of sediment, and then they can be removed. So we've now we've removed most of the solids from the water, which is good because we want to have, want to have a drinking level. After the sedimentation stage come the, comes the filtration stage. These are where fine filters are there, and these fine filters make sure that most, traps most of the particles that remain in the actual water, and that means that there's almost no solids left after filtration stage. This is also where some pathogens will also be removed. And the last stage is the chlorination or disinfection stage. Here we've got chlorine added to water, and that kills any remaining pathogens. Basically, you have these four stages. And these four stages make sure that drinking water has no solids left and no pathogens left by the end. And it goes through these one, two, three, four stages, basically, in most water treatment plants. This was the first part. We've described ways in which we um, can treat the actual pathogens, or sorry, the actual drinking water. And the next part says explain how these methods reduce the risk of infection from pathogens. In this case, explain how means show how these methods, so show how these methods can reduce the risk of infection. First, you should again realize that water can contain disease-causing pathogens, right? So they can cause, vi they can have viruses in them, bacteria, which means if people drink this water without it being treated, they would get disease. But first of all, if we have, if we boil our water, that would mean that if we boil our water, that would mean we kill the pathogens. So this disease-causing pathogens in the water would be lo no longer there. And thereby, disease would no longer be would no longer be caused in individuals, no longer transmitted. And the same with the water treatment plant. In these different stages, we have different things happening. So in stages one to two, which is coagulation and sedimentation, we have um, some of the pathogens actually become stuck on these clumps that form, 
And in the second stage, these clumps are then removed. So when the clumps are removed, we have pathogens removed. When pathogens are removed, that means less infection, right? So stage one and two form these clumps, and pathogens might get stuck in these clumps, and some do. Stage three is filtration, and here we have some bacteria and, and protozoa actually quite large, and they might get stuck at the filters, which means, again, less bacteria, less protozoa, and if there's less bacteria and protozoa in the actual water, that means less um, disease as well, right? So it reduces the risk of disease. And the last stage is the most obvious one, chlorination and disinfection. This kills any remaining pathogens, so in many cases viruses or small bacteria. And that means that if they're killed, that they're directly killed, then obviously means they're not in the water anymore, and thereby they can't cause disease. So that's what these two parts mean. Describe, you need to be able to describe and explain, and you need to go for each step and say how they remove bacteria from the actual water, or pathogens from the water. And this was it, so you can go down to the link here and go back to the actual playlist. I hope it was useful.